Has the American model of government run its course? Is our nation on the verge of a radical change, a departure from everything that we were based on and founded upon? In this edition of Truth For New Generation, we're going to unpack a question that I began to ask myself more than 20 years ago as I was speaking on American universities and I would hear professors continually denigrate America and I was watching students really be coached to dislike America and to believe everything about this country was wrong I began to ask the question 20 years ago, is America reaching her expiration date? That's what we'll discuss in depth on this edition of Truth For New Generation. Alexander Teitler was a Scottish lawyer, uh, a lay person in his church, a theologian, a historian. He lived 1747 to 1813, and he was intensely interested in the burgeoning young country, the United States of America. In just a moment, I want to share a quote by Alexander Teitler that I think is a very relevant quote for our times. But I welcome you to today's edition of Truth For New Generation, and I want to talk about the spiritual, political, and moral state of the United States of America. Hi, Alex McFarland here, and I'm so glad you're watching. We've got a great show with a very special guest that you'll meet in just a few moments. But let's talk for just a moment about what the founders envisioned the role of religion to be in public life. Nowadays, we're, we're conditioned to believe that the founders created a, a completely secular country, a country that would be really more of an economic experiment than anything moral and certainly not anything spiritual. In fact, nowadays, if you talk about spiritual things uh, in regard to public life or heaven forbid politics, uh, you're accused of having violated the First Amendment. And uh, it's almost like religion exists, but the founders envisioned a country free from religion, not influenced by moral convictions or religion. And we're going to unpack that and look at the legitimacy of that assumption here in just a minute. But I want to go back to the quote by Alexander Teitler. Now, he asked this question. He, he asked this question, you know, where is a country in the continuum of its birth and its growth and its founding? He said this, he said that whenever a, a culture understands that they can vote from the public treasury largesse for themselves or money, then people will always support candidates that will keep those benefits coming. And, and he goes on and he says that a nation goes from courage and birth to prosperity to uh, really decadence and then into bondage. And I, I believe that we are somewhere in that continuum. In fact, I, I think I know where we are in that continuum. But a country, uh, as Unwin said, the very famous Cambridge historian, Richard Unwin, he said, there's a country's state of being pro protective, then productive, then prosperous, then promiscuous, protective. You fight, you build the nation, then you become productive and you work hard and you're industrious and you engage in deferred gratification and you save your money. But then hard work and right living gives prosperity. Now, Teitler would say this, Richard Unwin would say this, many an observer and Pundit has said this, when a generation or more comes along and they don't understand how you got what you have, uh, you are promiscuous. You take it for granted. You don't realize what it took to give the prosperity. The very famous colonial era thinker Edmund Burke said this. Now listen carefully. That which we obtain too easily, we esteem too lightly. That which we obtain too easily, we esteem too lightly. If it didn't cost us anything, we don't attach a value to it. That's why I really believe that entitlement programs and welfare and just giving away money, the redistribution of wealth is very counterproductive. 
Because when people don't attach a value to something and they don't realize what it took to get the blessings and the benefits that you've gotten, they really won't appreciate it. They'll take it for granted. Now, how this relates to the state of the country and the preservation of America, we'll talk about with our very special guest, Congressman Mark Walker from North Carolina. Don't go away. Truth for a New Generation Television is back right after this. There is something welcoming about prepared places. At The Cove, we extend that welcome every single day. From the panoramic views, chef-crafted meals, and spacious meeting rooms, to our serene mountain lodging, stone fireplaces, and inviting rocking chairs. Our setting, carved into 1,200 wooded acres of the Blue Ridge Mountains, and our personalized service will ensure that your group's visit is both memorable and renewing. No wonder we find such great comfort when Jesus says his Father's house has many rooms that he is preparing for us. So, the table is being set. Hearthside, the fires are ablaze. The stage is lit, the mic's checked. Come, experience this place prepared for you and your group at The Cove. Hi, Alex McFarland here. Welcome back to Truth For A New Generation, talking about the spiritual, moral, political state of our country. So honored to have here on set our guest, Congressman Mark Walker from my home state of North Carolina. Thanks for making time to be with us. Yeah, we're glad to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, I want to say I appreciate your service for our country. And I appreciate all that you do. And, you know, as you and I film this, uh, it's been a busy 24 hours. Uh, uh, the election. And by the time this show airs, I mean, I don't know. And we don't know if it'll all be resolved. But just what are your take on this election season and uh, kind of where we are? Everybody says a divided nation. Uh, we'll see. But w what do you think? Well, I uh, I was in, certainly impressed by our home state, and uh, as far as uh, turning out, uh, a lot of the pollsters had said this was going a different direction. I, uh, I think it's nip and tuck as we talk right now yeah. in Wisconsin. I think ABC did a poll that where the president was down 17 points. I, I think that sometimes suppresses the vote, or yeah. at least has a tendency. It's another story, obviously, but I do believe that this is going to go back and forth. I was glad that we were able to maintain the Senate as yeah. a as a conservative Republican. That was important to us. Sure, of course. Um, this is a question a lot of people are asking, or maybe a lot of more conservative people. Do you think there has been or is being an honest vote count? Uh, for the most part, I think there is. But but at the same time, uh, some of these swing states, the margin of error is so small that you have to be able to really scrutinize the process. Uh, four years ago, it was the Democrats that were all up in arms about uh, voter integrity. I'm not not hearing a great deal about that right now with all these mail-in votes. Right. It does give us some pause. There have been some examples where there has been fraudulent behavior. Uh, we, we have every right, and we should, to continue to monitor that. Do, do you think mail-in votes and, and even proxy voting, I mean, is this just the new normal? I, I, I hope not, specifically the proxy voting. When Speaker Pelosi abused her power in the House to, uh, historically, through famine and flood and world wars, Members of Congress have always made their way to the to the Capitol to represent the people who they swore an oath that they would. And and this, we had one of the members who were out, was out on his yacht <laughs> trying to vote by proxy. It's ridiculous. Yeah. I hope that we can get past that. Sure, I, I agree. You know, um, two days ago, as we filmed this, November second, the president issued an executive order called the 1776 mm -hmm. Commission. Yes. Uh, basically, patriotic education. And um, I want to talk about that in general, then pull out specifically a couple of, I think, very important words in there. But um, uh, the president says school children are being taught to, uh, you know, hate this country. And our founders are often vilified. Um, how important do you think it is that we tell upcoming generations, look, this is a good country? It's, it's absolutely. And I'm not making the case, and neither are you, that we get it all right from day one. Sure. But we grew. That's the thing that separated America from all other countries. And now this republic provides more opportunity for all of our communities than any other nation in the world. I was most surprised uh, maybe three or four years ago when a World War II veteran brought up his great-granddaughter's history book mm. and showed me there was one paragraph talking about World War II. I mean, that's it's it's a it's very problematic. 
And the indoctrination that we're seeing from the education system has created this mindset, this, this kind of lean towards socialism that we have never seen at any point in our history. Do you think um, the current um, interest in socialism is temporary or, and I mean, I can't believe I'm asking this, uh, Congressman Walker, but I mean, are we headed irrevocably toward being a socialist country? I, I don't think at this point, but unless some things change, the influences that we have on the generation that's maybe a little younger than I am, uh, whether it's their education, whether it's their arts and entertainment, the social media, every medium that is in their contact of daily life has a tendency to push them toward more a federalized government making all the decisions in their life, whether it's their health care, uh, e even in recently in the COVID crisis, even some of the religious mandates that we have seen. Yeah. That's what we're seeing, and it's conditioning this younger generation to accept that without pushback. Why were the founders so interested in states' rights? I, I, I mean, in fact, that even um, held up the ratification of the Constitution mm -hmm. because many people wanted to know that states' rights would be protected. Um, how... How significant is that, that we recognize the rights? Because they had come from a monarch, one system dictatorship, but they knew this and they had experienced this. The more localized that you can make government, the more effective it can be. The more bureaucratic it can be, that's when it creates all problems. When you have elitist in, in the top of Capitol Hill or mm -hmm. wherever in Washington, D.C., making these decisions, whether it's in the education area that we talked about or anywhere else, when you should be looking to localize those decisions because who knows better for education? Who knows better than the parents in your local school boards to make those decisions as opposed to bureaucracies in Washington, D.C.? Uh, Mark, I remember 20 years ago uh, plus when Clinton was in office and Hillary Clinton was in charge of revising health care. Mm -hmm. um, and she said that we needed to federalize law enforcement. Mm. And this is a long time ago. And, but she was caught. Now we're hearing <clears throat> about defund the police. Right. So talk to me about how important it is in, in you know, government being localized. Uh, uh, the uh, undermining of law enforcement or even calls for federalizing law enforcement. Yeah, it's it's tragic to see the boldness of some of the language of the radical left. Uh, even since I've been in Congress, I've, I've served a six, six years, I've served as a pastor for 16 years in the last six years. Even when I arrived, there were still remnants of where the left was trying to do this deceitfully or, or behind closed doors. We've reached a place in just a short period of time that now it's more in your face, try and stop us. But we're seeing that with defund the police, some things that we would, would have never been even a rational conversation. But we're seeing all of this because <clears throat> there is a design at the base of it is to garner control. Mm -hmm. If I control every aspect of anything that impacts your daily life, then you have to come to me for any decision that you might make, whether it's emotional, whether we talked about the health care, whether it's religious based, anything. That's that was what Thomas Jefferson and some of the founding fathers really pushed back on when it comes to the federal government having control of your daily life. That's why you just mentioned states' rights, where you have that individual opportunity to go and pursue and prosper in the way that you deem fit. You know, uh, we can make <clears throat> good arguments, we can give evidence, but I think the founders believed one of the things that would keep us in check personally and guard our freedoms nationally was religion and morality. Yes. And yep. the, the president in his execu executive order on, um, you know, patriotic education talked about George Washington's phrase, the laws of nature and nature's God. I was so thrilled because I've never heard a president in my lifetime used the phrase natural law, speaking of morals and absolute truth. So here's my question to you. How important is it for the preservation of our civil rights, the preservation of order? How important is it that we are a country that believes in, in morals? It's 100% it's, it's essential to the fabric of our foundation, but also to our survival as the longest republic in the history of the world. It is without doubt something that we may stay focused on. If you start with the fundamental belief, fundamental belief that we are created in the very, very image of God, that is your starting place. That is where you begin your moral thought process because you could take any country in the world. They may have a different set of rules or regulations or laws that may be offensive to us, 
Well, who are we to override their morality unless it starts from the same foundational absolute authority, which many of us believe comes from the Word of God, but specifically the fact that we are created in His likeness? So, wonderful. So, but, but if you talk about morals, mm -hmm. talk about the nature of marriage, nowadays even if you say, you know, men are men, women are women, human, you know, physiology— um, the, many on the left will say, well, that's a violation of the First Amendment, the non-establishment clause. Uh, Congress will make no law regarding the establishment of religion. Okay, how do we help people understand that the freedom of religion uh, clause doesn't mean the eradication of all morals? Well, I, well, first of all, I think it starts with the understanding, the very history of the principles of, of how this country was launched. Uh, you cannot find any documents for the first 100, 150 years that this moral clause was not very vividly woven into it. Even our chief justice said national prosperity cannot survive or is it obtainable without God's favor. Mm -hmm. Every bit of this, the, the, the verses that are etched in marble in Washington, D.C., all of it are centralized pieces of information that go back to one center point that we are created in the image of God. And that is the basis of our morality. Um, you, you know, the, the uh, street fight that erupted over the, the uh, uh, Justice Gorsuch and mm. Kavanaugh yes. and then Amy Coney Barrett. Um, I've got a, a follow-up question regarding the uh, seating of Justice Barrett. But um, I felt like a lot of the brouhaha was because Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and now Barrett, their legal tradition um, speaks to natural law. Mm -hmm. And it's not just conservative versus liberal or moderate, but it's do you believe in absolute morality or don't you? And uh, that's why I think there's been such an arm wrestling match over the makeup of the court. Would yes. you agree? Oh, you just nailed it, Alex. Um, what is happening here, <clears throat> if you've got two competing ideals, you've got this socialistic mindset that seems to be taking, getting, gaining speed, and you have this moral clause that we're talking about of understanding natural law. These two do not compete in the same environment. So if you're promoting this, you must first eradicate this mindset, which is the control that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. If you can uh, subjugate or if you can uh, embarrass or ridicule or quiet or silence the Amy Coney Barrett's, the Gorsuch's, the Kavanaugh's to a place where they're no longer willing to come out publicly and talk about these issues, it gives you more of an opportunity to introduce these things in our society, and that's what we're seeing play out in the political arena. Are you concerned for the preservation of the U.S. Constitution? Uh, most definitely. Uh, first of all, it's not even being taught in many places anymore. But even now, specifically the First and Second Amendment, uh, as far as the freedom of speech, we're seeing this with big tech constantly. Uh, and this censorship. Is something, censorship. I've, I've had House Oversight Committee, Committee hearings where we brought in Google and Twitter and Facebook. Some of the gamesmanship that they are playing right now, it's very blatant, very obvious, even censoring the president when he made some comments during the election. Uh, so what, what's the answer to that? Because, you know, big tech and social media is just such a huge part of everybody's life. I mean, it, it, it really is. And, and I think the monopoly that you're seeing in some of the antitrust laws that we have in the books, I think you, you have to be careful that you do not want to go after private entities. So, so we wouldn't want them coming after us. Sure. Yeah, at the same time, if you're operating a different set of rules where you're allowing a set of ideology, yet at the same time you're censoring the others, it does give the government some grounds, some leeway to come in and make some decisions. You, you mentioned the, the beliefs of the founders etched in marble yes. all over our capital. And it's been my privilege with a lot of great folks like David Barton yes. and Bill yeah. Federer and right. uh, Tony Perkins. We go over D.C. and see all these things. And right. it's, it's very beautiful. Summer of 2020, we saw monuments pulled down. Mm -hmm. We saw graffiti and vandalism. Um, is there a concerted effort to erase our history from public knowledge what? and and introduce a new story? Without a doubt. As I was saying, this new introduction doesn't compete with the greatness of how God has blessed this country over the last several hundred years. Uh, people that are willing to look at it, that even uh, are looking at both different ideologies, if you look, they just simply do not stand up with each other. So that is why the left 
has become so passionate. In fact, when you remove God out of this element, you create a vacuum, yeah. which is now the new religion. And that's why you see the militant mindsets that so hate what you and I believe when it comes to the moral consciousness, the moral clause, or even our faith in general. It offends this particular group, and that's why they want to eradicate it completely off the face of the earth. Did, did the Founding Fathers assume that in succeeding generations there would be the influence of religion and morality over the, the course of our nation? They, they never, it never crossed their mind that it wouldn't be part of our nation's decision-making, even in the political arena. They never separated it. This whole We've talked about this and don't have time to get into the separation of church and state. But they wanted to make sure by the very language and everything that they wrote or implemented at that time it started with the fact that we are created and we, are, we get our rights from God, not from man. That's the fundamental difference. This group over here that's a socialistic, it believes, this is the secularism mindset that we are the ultimate authority. Uh, our founding fathers, you couldn't have found a single one that would have agreed with that mindset. I want to say thank you for serving our country. Um, you and I come from the same uh, part of North Carolina. Yes. And, uh, and uh, I know it, it can't have been easy to really... Just uh, change change your whole direction, but I want to say thanks for what you're doing for for God and country. Well, it's been my privilege. Uh, you know, we didn't we didn't know we didn't know what we didn't know when we decided to transition from the ministry. We didn't have the capital. We didn't know the connections in Raleigh or Washington. But God, we felt like God was leading us in that direction, and we tried to be obedient. And He's opened up some wonderful doors for us. Uh, can we can we talk some more about all these things on a future date? Hey, I look forward to it. Congressman Mark Walker. Hey, folks, you're watching Truth for a New Generation. Let me encourage you. Uh, I've written a couple of books, 10 Issues That Divide Christians, more recently the book, The Assault on America. Know our country's story and how you can play a role in that story today. Stay tuned. We're back after this. What is truth? What is truth? Truth. Shabam, there it is, the big kahuna, the spicy enchilada, the fizzy lifting drink. The claim God exists is not a subjective claim. This is not an evidence problem. So, like, truth is basically subjective. Yeah, yeah. emotional. This is Debunk TV. Welcome back to Truth For New Generation. Alex McFarland here. What a joy to have had uh, Congressman Mark Walker on to talk about the country. And let me wrap up by giving some thoughts about the preservation of our nation through the preservation of knowledge of morals and religion. You know, R.C. Sproul was a great scholar. He died in 2017, and he was commenting on Proverbs 1-7, and he said, if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, then the denial of God is the height of foolishness. And I would agree. And yet we've been living in a culture that has really denied God or ignored God. And um, I, I think that's one of the things that made Germany so susceptible to the rise of Hitler. Uh, Dr. Dobson, my former boss, was touring Berlin, and he wanted to find out how Hitler uh, took over formerly Christian Germany. And, and he went and he toured all of these places, and they toured where uh, the Nazi propaganda ministry uh, went forth, uh, Goebbels' house and office and things like that. And one of the tour guides told the group that the Nazi party rose to power because they had such a control in the media, the communication, and yes, all of the public schools. In fact, Hitler said, quote, to Germany, your child belongs to us already. In a short time, they will know nothing but the new community. And so for years on end, communicating, uh, really using language and intimidating people, and children were even encouraged to eavesdrop on their parents' conversations and report to teachers and authorities things that their parents said against the government. Folks, we've been living in a time of political correctness and really spin and the, the, the nuances of language, and we're in danger of losing our freedoms if we don't recover belief in truth, belief in morals, Yes, a personal relationship with God, religious convictions, but also the courage, the courage to speak.
Just like Congressman Walker has courageously left his comfort zone to take a stand and be a representative, I want to challenge you to know what you believe and know why you believe it and understand if we don't have moral boundaries and people that are willing to speak, act, influence, and live out their convictions, there's personal implications for that. There's national implications. The future of our country and making sure that we've not gone past our expiration date, I believe, depends on the recovery of God and morality. You can make a difference in these things. Stay tuned to Truth for a New Generation. Swung on, there's a fly ball to right field. Yeah. The mighty USS Arizona. The safety of the car on the highway. To set before them good examples of moral living. And cover. Smoke him, smoke him, then you see. I don't believe in big government. I have a dream. It's stimulating. One small step for man. Well, I'm not a crook. Anywhere near Jonestown. It's lady. The shuttle Challenger has exploded. Tear down this wall. But I want to say one thing. I watched the plane fly into the World Trade Center. The internet is amazing, and it's changing every day. Oh, jolly! Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. Change has come to America. You want to talk to me? You want to talk to me? You want to talk to me? What in the world is going on? Welcome back to Truth for a New Generation. Alex McFarland here. I want to say a big thanks to all who've been reading my brand new book, The Assault on America. If you enjoy learning about the inspiring history of our country and how you can make a difference to stand for our country and our freedoms today, read this book. It makes a great gift. It's good for all ages. The Assault on America, How to Defend Our Country Before It's Too Late. It's available everywhere online and also at Barnes & Noble. But I want to say a big thanks for those who are supporting our ministries. We're engaging with thousands and thousands of people every week. We're on the radio seven days a week, on television, on social media. And for your gift, your support gift of at least $50, I want to send you our award-winning video series, The 21 Toughest Questions Your Kids Will Ask About God. More than seven hours of teaching. It's great for small groups. Entire churches are using it. Of course, I'll include the most recent edition of the Truth for a New Generation newsletter. But for your gift of at least $75, I'll include our great apologetics t-shirt, Better Living Through Apologetics. Really retro, really cool. The TNG logo is on the back, so you, you can witness and use it as a conversation starter. But I want to encourage you, pray for our country. Stay informed, stand strong, make a difference. Be an influence. And thanks for watching and supporting Truth for a New Generation.